So this is the April group therapy. It's the training webinar equivalent of sitting down and having tea and biscuits. So this is an informal webinar where we do expect some interaction. And primarily, the, the point of these webinars kind of primarily is to help people that have taken a particular course with Jigsaw, the institutional course, and are now looking to implement some of the setups from that course. But some of the people we're talking about today are people that didn't take the course and that are going through a very similar process in terms of getting to profit. So whether you're you know, using one of these trading strategies or whether you're using a trading strategy of your own, this will still help you. Okay, and so what we're going to talk about today is we're going to follow on from the trading discussion we talked about last week where we looked at a particular guy, CN, and where he was getting in his trading and, and what advice we'd given him to get to the next level. Now, before I do that, I just want to give throw something out there because a few times in my trading career, I've met people, and it's probably been three or four people, I've met people who have got to such a point with their trading that they're actually dominating a market, right? So a couple of years ago, the most recent one, um, actually, there's, there's a guy actually at a prop firm I know now that's, that's quite often, he's quite a large percentage of one market. But there was a, a guy I met in Thailand a couple of years ago, and he was trading uh, Singapore Futures Exchange. And on one of the futures contracts on the Singapore Exchange, he was 30% of the total volume of that exchange. And he wanted to switch over to one of the Thai exchanges and try, was trying to get a discount. Uh, that's the reason he spoke, he was contacting me. He was trying to get a discount on the commissions at the Thai exchange. Uh, because he was such a large percentage of the market all on his own in Singapore, he figured that they'd actually give him a really good discount, which they should have done, to, to move over to the Thai market. And they didn't, um, obviously not understanding that. But if you just think about that for a second, that a trader could get to the point where he's 30% of an entire exchange, right? So think about that. Now I want you to think about who can teach that? Who could teach somebody to be 30% of an exchange? And I would say nobody, because there aren't, first of all, there aren't that many of them around. I've met uh, people that have done it on some of the UX markets. Um, I met a guy who got, um, who got banned by the, the FTSE futures. Um, he was primarily a, a US a stock trader, but he used to trade FTSE out of hours, and he actually got banned for manipulating the market on his own account, right outside of hours. This is massive trading. And um, one of the interesting things, if you think about people like that, first of all, when I talk to people like that, when I talk to other traders, I talk to them about what they do. But whenever I meet one of these guys that dominate the market like that, I kind of, I'm kind of awestruck. It's like, it's kind of asking Brad Pitt how he's so handsome, right? Um, you kind of feel a bit stupid asking, but, it's like, but also it's, it's not something I could ever benefit from or, or do myself. But with these guys, it's like you have to think, how do you get to that point? And it's interesting for us as retail traders, because as retail traders, you know, sometimes we look at, um, look at where we get in those first steps in the market that we're going to take. And we always try to be very reliant on somebody else to, to help us get to those first steps uh, and not to be, um, you know, not to be self-sufficient, not to be self-driven. And obviously what you've got to think about, if, if traders are getting to 30% of the market, there is absolutely nobody that can teach them that, right? It's like teaching Tiger Woods how to play golf. Sure, you can give him some help, but you know, no matter how good a teacher you are, you're never going to be able to... Um, teach them specifically how to get to that point. So people can learn to trade. Where they get with it is kind of up to them. But what I can say, the people that get to the 30%, they all started out um, in prop firms or in a, you know, an environment where they were learning and they all started out exactly where most of the people in this room are now, right? And, and so I want you to think about, you know, some of the people in the position you're at now they got to this point where, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of the one in a million traders, right? And, and that wasn't something they taught. Now, as I've been helping people a lot more over the past few months, I've had some opinions that have had to change, right? And some of the opinions I've had to change, I used to have an opinion about why traders at prop firms were so, um, 
so much more successful than traders at home. Now, can I just ask, do we have any women in this room at the moment? Are there any, are there any females in here? Good, Karen. I know we're not allowed in this day and age with political correctness. We're not allowed to talk about, um, you know, about the, the sex, male and female. So maybe we should talk about the race, male and female. So we got a uh, twin sex, uh, twin sex, and a female. Okay, I don't know what twin sex is, but there you go. Um, okay, so if you're not female, you're going to relate to a lot of this, and if you are female, you're absolutely going to relate to a lot of this. So this is a photograph that I took. Right, and this kind of explains a lot about um, our behaviours, uh, and I think women have got it a little bit easier than men for, for certain reasons, that just men are just a bit uh, useless in many ways, but this is a picture I took while my wife was behind me saying, that's poisonous, that is, and I was saying, no, it's green, it won't do any harm, it's kind of a harmless thing. And uh, after that, when I actually looked at this, uh, <laughs> looked up this snake, Later on, it's actually something called a green-lipped pit viper. And I thought it was quite funny that, um, you know, me being the man and I'm like, you know, on my knees taking a picture of this snake that, uh, that isn't normally fatal, but just fatal on some occasions. I actually went and looked up some of the statistics on snake bites. And 90% of snake bite victims are men, right? And... 50 to 80 percent of snake bites are on the hand or face. Now, to, to, uh, maybe it's just me, but I know ex when you tell me that 90 percent of men and uh, so 90 or 90 percent of men, 50 to 80 percent are on the hand and face. I know exactly what's going on there. That's men poking snakes, right? Because that's what we do. Because we are, in many ways, uh, a bit stupid, right? Now, 20 to 40 percent of the incidents also involved victims that were drunk and 46% of the time uh, victim was handling a snake when bit but the key thing is that that men we tend to behave in certain ways and and I think that's one of the things we need to take into account so when I look at the the, the secret of prop firms I don't think it's what they teach them specifically I think it's just that you have to do what they're telling you or you're out so I'm going to ask you guys something, and I apologise to, to, to Karen and Al um, about this, but uh, this is mainly a question to the men. I'm going to go into the next slide, and I want, to, I want you to think about your first reaction to the next thing I'm going to say. Because I spoke to a, a trader a, a few weeks ago, and he was telling me about his losses and how his wife didn't know, right? So guys, when you see that, would you let your wife see the results of your trading each week? Don't, I don't want to know your first, I don't want to know your public reaction, right? The, the things that you should say. Why don't you tell me what you really think? What's your first gut reaction when you see that, right? For most people, it's gr good grief. No, yet this is the person that you've chosen to spend your life with, right? So I can say, hang on, I love my wife. I would love to spend the rest of... Uh, of my life with my wife and we have a, a very uh, good relationship and uh, yeah Anthony only the winners but thinking about it your wife would actually make the single best person to have a trading review with every week and the reason we would most of us wouldn't um, wouldn't like our way wife to see is because we we know we're kind of misbehaving a little bit Right, like we kind of poke in the snake a little bit, right? We're putting our face a bit too close. We're saying, no, no, you don't know. I can touch this snake, it won't bite me. You know, and that's because that's what we like as men. So there is something that, um, that exists there. There's a concept called, uh, yeah, sharing you with Lewis, sharing with your wife, right? To, it would be a relief to share with your wife, but basically there's something called an accountability part, partner. And... Um, it's not quite sh sharing with your wife, but an accountability partner is somebody that you're accountable to. So you can have an accountability partner, for instance, <clears throat> that you talk to once a week about your trading, about what you're going to do, and about what you actually did every week. Now, the best possible person to, to, have, to do that with would be your spouse, if you're married, um, would be your parents, if you're still living with them. It would actually be the last people you'd want to do it with precisely because they're the last people you want to do it with right 
So I think one of the things I'm seeing is because there is no accountability, and we have talked about this before, but people are misbehaving and they're doing things where if somebody was watching them, they wouldn't do that stuff, right? And, um, and I think that's one of the reasons that people in prop firms perform differently is because they do, they have to do what they told them. They have to toe the line. They can't try something different to the, the next day. They have this kind of a, it's, it's much a more rigid environment that they're working within compared to a retail trader who just sits down and can literally do whatever they want, right? Especially if somebody um, has got a full-time job and it's not so serious, but they can sit down on any one session and do exactly what they want. And there's a reason we're going to talk about that because we're going to talk about two traders now. And we're going to talk about two traders that were told to do something that perhaps is not the most exciting thing to do as a trader when you first hear about it, right? So if you remember from last week, we had Cameron and um, we had a, we, last week, the session still is recorded, it's available for you. But we went through the emails that, uh, that Cameron had sent and the discussion with Cameron and we kind of spliced and diced what he'd said and um, you know, we, we kind of brought a little bit more meaning out from what he said. Whether it was right or not, I don't know because it was our interpretation of what he said. But we had a look at what he was doing and, and what, he, what, he'd, you know, what, what he had with, within him, himself, you know, what kind of skills he brought to the table. And we found out that, you know, there were a few um, setups that he had in mind. He'd not got anything to work yet as a trader, right? Um, he did have a few things that he thought might work, but he had no structure to them. And um, he had a lot of, it just had a lot of baggage, basically. So what we did is we said, right, the first thing you have to do is you have to stop trading. So this is going back um, just the start of April, right? We'll look at the results in a second. So the first thing we told them to do is to stop trading, right? Because if you, um, if you don't know the rules of the game or you don't know uh, whether, you, whether a trade really has got a likelihood of, of, of working out or not, there's not really a lot of point in making a trade, right? So we like to poke the snake. We like to, to click buy and sell. But quite often we don't have any idea of the, the likelihood of that trade being um, a winner or not, right? So if you think about it, we're, we're in this game to, um, to, to trade and to actually make money from trading and to trade, to click buy and sell without really having any idea of whether that's likely to make money or not. It's kind of a, it's, it's a little bit daft. So the first thing was, was when we, I spoke to him, I said, look, you don't know really how to make money at the moment. And um, so the best thing you can do is stop trading figure out how to make money and then trade it, right? So instead of just trading and hoping you stumble across some things, and uh, we'll look at why that's impossible in a second, just stop trading, just stop for a couple of weeks. Now, again, a bit like when I said, how do you feel about, you know, reporting to your wife every week about your trading? I mean, how do, how do people in the room, you know, please answer the question, how do you feel about stopping trading for two weeks? Is that okay or what's your initial gut feel? It's like, so, so for me, initial gut feel is probably like, yeah, what he's saying is making a lot of sense and it'll be okay for other people, but you know, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I still want to click. I'm, I feel, yeah, Paul says better than losing money. Doug says hard, but it's like a lot of people will be like, they feel they're missing out by not clicking, right? They feel they're missing out. You feel like you're not trading. You feel not you, like you're not working, right? So with, with Cameron, we said, right, stop trading, right? Now observe one or two setups. Really doesn't matter what they are. Now I'm going to go back on that a little bit because uh, I have spoken to a few people since where we've looked at doing this, but they re they don't even have uh, what Cameron had, and they need to do to get a little bit more of a baseline um, before they do this exercise. It doesn't mean they have to go and, and click, but they need a they need they need some kind of ground, some kind of foundations to build on. Right, so, but basically we said, look, you know, let's look at one or two setups. So if you remember, he just had two hours in the morning. He was looking at the ultra bonds. Um, we basically went through with him a whole bunch of things, you know, what kind of markets he preferred, what he liked to do. And, and it was basically, we settled on something um, that, that suited him. 
right? And to just observe the market for a couple of days, looking at one or two setups, doesn't matter what they are, uh, how frequent they are, what the, you know, what the failure rate is, what the signal scope is. So the signal scope is a bit like hitting a bat, uh, a ball with a bat. It's like if you hit the ball with a bat, how far is it going to go? Is it going to go 10 miles or is it going to go a mile? And, you know, and let's say you hit the, the ball with a bat and you're on a mountain and you hit the ball 100 yards with the bat, but it kind of rolls all the way down to the bottom of the mountain. That's not you. That's not you hitting, hitting the ball there that's making it go down the mountain. That's gravity, right? So you've got to understand that, you know, what's the, sig what's the scope of a signal? When, that's, when that setup occurs, what's, you know, how long is it still influencing the market, right? Just because it carries on going up after that um, initial push, it uh, doesn't mean it's because of that setup, right? It just means the market can only go up or down anyway. But there's a signal scope. You know, market conditions, um, correlations, you know, what's going on in some of the other markets, see if we can get a handle on that. And, uh, and a couple of things we're trying to do here, then, and let's just go over a couple of other things I told him. As I said, you can't look at any trading webinars during these two weeks. You can't look at any, if you get an email about trading, even from me, uh, you can't open it. You know those emails you get in your inbox, like, you know, learn to trade in 20 seconds, you know, make a million dollars a minute, that kind of thing. You get those in the emails, not allowed to open them, can't go to any trading forums. Um, in fact, to just spend literally one or two hours a day, so for a lot of people that's also uncomfortable because people like to think that the amount of time they're putting into this is, is somehow going to turn into profits. But like kind of chill out, look for these one or two setups, let your brain do its, its work when you're offline. Um, you're building the pattern recognition skills for execution time. And then he said, well, how do I make my notes? You know, how do I make my notes? It's like, should I be structured? Should they free, be free format? And, um, and the answer is, well, whatever your, your comfort zone is, right? So the ultra bond was, his, was when he's comfortable, the one or two hours a day, because that's what he's got. Um, he's looking at markets he's comfortable with, setups he's, com he's comfortable with, uh, and just getting him to stick, just getting somebody to stick with one thing. Okay, and this is the end result. So let's just kind of qualify these results a bit. So Cameron is a pianist. So being a pianist, Cameron knows what it's like to spend a long amount of time being really, really crap at something before being good. So, you know, we're playing an instrument, you know, maybe after six months or a year, uh, somebody who's not a, an expert can, can hear you and like, wow, that's, that's really good. Um, but for, for a long time, you're not even at that level that anybody hears you, you're going to be bad. And that's, uh, that whole process is very, it's, it, it changes people. Um, it's something my own children are learning instruments, not because I necessarily want them to be the next Madonna and Sting, but because I want them to have that experience of being bad at something and understanding what happens if you apply yourself over and over again and improve. So he's already been through that. So for Cameron, it was no problem at all to do this, and these are the results. So basically, this is the result of looking for a very specific setup on the Ultrabonds for two hours a day, right? Now, I was a little bit surprised at the frequency. Okay, we have had some volatility in the market, but because he's only got two hours a day in the morning, he has to find a setup with frequency, right? There's no point getting a setup that occurs once a week, right? He's got two hours a day. He needs to get, to, if, for him to improve uh, and to really practice and, and keep going at something, he needs something that happens frequently. So um, these are the days he looked. He had three days off. Um, and so 11 occurrences, 7, 7, 6, 6, 1, which is obviously the low end, 5, 4, 4, 2, 10. So we had a total of 63 setups in two weeks, at more than enough. Now the average success rate and the total ticks profit was all based on the presumption of if you got in using a market order, right? So this isn't about, I saw something happen and if there was a, you know, if there was a fill on a limit order, you know, which you probably wouldn't have got. Um, so this is if you got filled on a market order and uh, obviously based on a very specific setup. Now, this is a pattern he's observed. Um, he could have spent the two weeks and found that the pattern didn't work, right? So the, he could have quite easily spent the two weeks and really found that it didn't work. But in that two weeks, he would have learned something and without doubt would have, would have had something for the next step. Now, he didn't know it would work 
Um, I didn't know it would work, but we we kind of got our heads together and kind of figured this is actually something worth looking into. But now, what does he know now, right? So he knows now something about this market and how it behaves in the, you know a certain behaviour that that it does actually have potential, right? Now, what he can do from this point on is he can carry on observing this. So this is the first time he'd uh, made these observations. So the next, uh, this, was from, this was from last week. Uh, and so his next step, he's still doing the observations. His next step is to actually try to, um, try to sim trade this, right? So what he's doing now, he's still noting every day how many times this happens, how many times it holds, how many times it failed. That's going to be very easy for him now because second nature for him, he's been doing it. Uh, he's, been, he's done it for, for um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It's done it for 11 days, right? So he knows what he's doing in terms of the observations. But also, he's going to have another spreadsheet to the side which is going to detail what he did, how he traded it, right? And we've talked about this a number of times is that once you um, have an idea, once you got are able to document how the market is working, then if you try and execute it, he's going to be able to notice these occurrences. They're not happening that often. There's, there's too many to note down. It's a really good frequency. But he will know when this happens again and he sim trades it, he will know if that behavior was still there and what the potential for profit and what the potential for loss was. You know, it's only 4.7 ticks a trade. It's not a massive trade. But it was 240 ticks total on the ultra bond with a tick size of 32 and the ability to quite easily trade 10 or 20 uh, contracts, right? So that's, that, there's a lot of potential there. So when he's trading it, even on SIM, he will know if it is trading that's bad or the market's behaving differently. And you know what? You could observe a market behavior and three months later it stops. But the fact you've been able to do this once means you can do it again. It's just, this is, this is part of the, the learning process, right? And, and the big difference between somebody who wants to go out and, and get a setup from somebody else and somebody who, who wants to, 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 to work a setup place on their own. So now Cameron has the ability to see a market behavior, to track it, you know, just for a few weeks. And, and I say a few weeks because I actually know a market maker um, who is a very, very experienced trader. But when he moves to a new market, it usually takes him a couple of weeks to kind of get used to at that market and before he'll go and trade it live, right? So I, I, the reason I advise two weeks is because that's what he uses. So, but anyway, Cameron's now got the ability to watch this market, sim trade it, and for every sim trade to know if it doesn't go right, whether it's him or the market. Now we're gonna look at one other person, right? So we've got another guy, um, this guy's German, he he's a different guy, he's in Germany. Um, I'm not gonna give you too much about his background because he might come on live now. And uh, we basically went through the same thing. Now, what we did um, with Peter is basically we we looked again. We just did an analysis of when he can trade. Good, good for him. He's got a lot more time available. When he can trade, what, you know, what he can do, what's what kind of setups he's looking at. What he's had some moderate success with. If you had some, if you had some moderate success with something, we can. There's a good chance that that's that's obviously what you want to build on. You don't really want to start completely again. And and so. You know, so we're left with the same thing. This is what we're going to observe. We're going to spend two weeks and we're not going to trade it. And we're just going to focus on really understanding that behavior. Now, the reason we, there's a couple of reasons that we don't trade it. Um, first of all is you might end up seeing something completely different. There's a very, very high chance. So I remember one guy who was looking for small ranges on crude uh, because he wanted to trade, uh, fade the ranges on crude and he ended up finding a breakout setting. And he did that through this period of observation. So part of this period of observation is just to get somebody to observe the market, so actually watching what it does. So, and, and maybe they'll come out with something different, right? And, that, and that's absolutely fine. So anyway, day one, I got an email, update from Peter, I got an email every day. I'm not gonna take you through them all, but we'll take you through the, um, the key ones. So day one, is I watch the market behavior primarily without trading, I can open trades periodically if it does not impact my observation reading, okay? So does anybody have any comments? Anybody see anything um, maybe a little bit off plan with that? 
Oh, you've all gone to sleep. Okay, well, I'll tell you what's off plan with that, right? So, yeah, primarily, well, whether it's primarily, yeah, you're right, Al, it's, it's like primarily without trading, right? So he's already decided that he's going to kind of break the rules. Yeah, Paul, exactly right. Paul is saying a trade will affect the observation, right? So it's not subatomic physics, but it is right. A trade will affect the observation. So uh, like a lot of guys like Peter, Peter's a, a fairly, um, a very successful executive, right? He's used to people doing what he says um, and not the other way around, generally speaking. Right, so he's a very successful guy. He's always been a very successful thing. Very much used to doing things his own way. So day one, I got this. I'm, I'm going to do it primarily without trading. I can open trades periodically if it does not impact my observation reading. So the instructions were very clear. It was to not trade, right? So anything, when, you, when, when one of the key instructions is not trade, anything that involves trading is obviously going against those instructions. So we can see, as we got some results, we got observation, trade, observation, trade, trade. Okay, that's fine. Didn't, no comment from me, right? Because it's not like I'm his dad or anything. I'm not, I'm not there to, um, I'm not there to kind of say, look, I said don't trade. You've got to listen to me because I'm the man. It's like, dude, you know, you, got, you guys got to do things for yourself, right? You know, I can, I can say what I think. But if you think better, then maybe you're right and I'm wrong. But, you know, okay. So anyway, as he went forward, I kept getting, you know, I was getting emails every day. And the general tone of the emails were, one of like um, excitement, disappointment, excitement, disappointment. One of one of ups and downs. Well, a lot of the, I mean, mostly it was going well, um, but it was one of ups and downs. So we can see on day eight, um, he connected to one up, and he was up over a thousand dollars. End up down nineteen fifty. Right. This is somebody going through a period of observation to try and find a setup. Right. And then also on day eight, I got this email. I was super frustrated. Obviously, so I was thinking, what can I change in my trading process? Looked at the Stephen Kelly method, so the leaderboard, and one of the best trades was Mr. Gecko. And he saw that Mr. Gecko has got an average loss trade of $43 versus 786 average winners. Now, there's a couple of reasons Mr. Gecko has got average winners bigger than these average losers. First of all, he's a prop trader, right? So I, I, don't, I don't really told anybody about this, but Mr. Gecko is in a prop firm, right? So, yeah, he's right. But also, he scales into trades, right? So if you scale into trades, you're scaling into your winners. It's not like doing like um, an all-in, all-out where your winners are a lot bigger because, you're, you know, because they're going so far. It's because you're, he's actually getting into them. Right, so as a result, he changed a few things and sim traded for the past couple of days and, and then he got a certain outcome. But this is kind of like... This is part of the, the problem, right? So this is the guy, this is me, because I can't say anything about him, right? Because I've already shown you the picture of me uh, kneeling down in front of a green-lit pit viper to take a photo, because it's green, it can't be poisonous, right? Because um, so, what do I know? So this is somebody who's basically saying, um, you know, who wants to trade, right? This is somebody who feels that if they're not trading, they're missing out on something, okay? So the thing that will happen and the thing that, um, that, that Paul has just said is that a trade will affect the observation. And what you have with a sim trade is you have um, an emotional um, attachment or an emotional investment in the outcome. You are, when you put on a sim trade, you are invested in the outcome, right? If it goes your way, that is a winner. If it goes against you, that's a loser. Well, actually, that's not the way it is. So, for instance, um, if you found out that if 90% of the trades went against you, or if you were just observing, and 90% of the time the outcome went the other way, right, to what you thought it would, you would actually have a very valid setup for fading. It just means you've got the right behavior you're looking at, you just got the wrong outcome. Right, so if you, if you knew that 90% of the time it went against you, from a sim trading perspective, that would be a disaster. And you wouldn't carry on for that long. You would not carry on for two weeks sim trading something that failed 90% of the time. Right, there's no way you do it. And for the 90% for the of the time, for the 10 winners, you'd probably be really interested in looking at them and details and go over the video and that. But the 90% losers, you wouldn't feel so inclined to 
really go in depth on those. So you would miss you would miss stuff. I don't see how you couldn't miss stuff. So if as an observer, you could say, wow, 90% of the time it went the other way. I'll, I'll fade it. And you'd be quite happy with that. But once you, once you start trading it, you are emotionally invested. And that's one of the reasons where I said, you know, if you don't know the potential outcome of the game, you shouldn't really play the game, right? If you don't really know what the potential outcome is, what the likely outcome is. And to, and to find the likely outcome, the best way isn't necessarily to play the game, right? It's like Russian roulette, you know, if you didn't know the likely outcome of Russian roulette, you know, you, you, might, you might play, you might, you know, decide to play Russian roulette with, with two people to your last man standing. It's probably not a great idea. But, um, you know, unless you're, um, if you're not, um, you know, if you, if you don't know the rules of the game, it's very difficult to play. Now, fortunately, uh, I did send an email. <laughs> And, uh, and, and I think this email, it, and the guy's good, the guy's absolutely cool with this, and he's absolutely cool that we're talking about this today. Um, this is what I said, you know, Gecko is a prop trader. And um, like these guys who got to that 30% of one market, you just can't get there. He, even, if, even if Gecko came in and sat down and clicked the button for you, it, like, literally put his hand on top of your hand and just click, help click the mouse with you for a couple of weeks, it leave the, it leave and you would not be able to do it, right? Because just experience he's got, right? So that's how the guys get 30%. So it doesn't matter what level Gecko is at, right? It doesn't matter what level anyone is at. It doesn't matter what some guy in a webinar says he can do. It doesn't matter what an email coming in telling you about the latest trading system can, can do. It doesn't matter. None of that matters. All that matters is what you can see and then what you can, what you can get out of what you're seeing. Yeah, so Doug, I'm saying we should watch and not even sim trade because even that distorts the ability to objectively see what's happening. I am Doug, but I'm not saying you should just watch for anything. I'm saying you, ne you need like a couple of trades I've talked to this week. You need to get to the point where you can figure out what to watch, right? I mean, a lot of the guys on the Axie course have done that. A lot of guys that come to Jigsaw have already got a fair idea. I mean, I talked to a guy today, um, or yesterday, sorry, and he was just, no, it was today, sorry, it was Greg. And he was like, um, he's been looking at for trading for, since 2001. Um, he's had some time off and, and he got deployed and, and stuff like that. But, you know, and he said, he was really arms up. I've got nothing, I've got nothing, I've got nothing. And, and I sent him away and said, well, you know, you've got, it, you've got more than nothing. You, you've, got, you've got some time looking at the markets. There must be something we must, there must be something in terms of choice of market or something you bring to the table. But anyway, we've given him some stuff stuff to do to try and uh, to try and pull that out of him you know and, and it might just be you know looking at icebergs initially but um it's not just just generally you know just stare at a screen and hope something comes out you know there's guidelines and we can say well you know like for instance if the market's just putting a reversal and it's pulling back now look for now look try and see what you can see for for that pullback continuing um you know from the counter trend you know, and see if you can see something there. So, you know, this, this, it's like, it's not like you've got to stare from scratch and just stare at a dome and I hope something pops out. You know, we all know stuff about the market. We all know that markets have momentum. We all know that markets reverse. We all know markets pull back. We all know that markets go into ranges. The guy today, he's going to look at uh, some of the order flow stuff and some of the, um, some of the volume profile things, right? So, but, you know, once you've got that kind of framework, well, well this is what I think I want to, this is what I think I want to do, and this this is my logical setup. Then you then you need to know it before you trade it, right? Um, I said the frustration comes to your need to be clicking the buy and sell buttons. Now I would like to say that um, you know, so he's he's doing well actually now because um, he's got some other issues he needs to sort out. He actually went to um, to Rich Friesen. If you if you don't know if you know Rich Friesen or not, um, I don't know exactly what the issue that Peter had with uh, with and I'm, and I wouldn't you know tell you if I did, but some some people do have uh, um, I'm one of them. Um, my personal relationship with money needed to be kind of ironed out because my father worked in a factory, um, you know, in a, in a factory at night, and he worked really 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 hard. He worked really 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 hard. And um, so some of us have been brought up in an environment where we've got this very, uh, we've got this attitude towards work, towards work and money. So in my case, I actually felt guilty for earning money. I, I, I just felt guilty for being successful. 
and part of that. And I, and I also, I felt guilty if I was successful and I wasn't working 60 hours a week. And part of that is just that I grew up in a, an environment where money wasn't abundant, but my father had to work really, really, really hard. So, you know, Peter's worked with Rich Friesen and, and part of what Rich did, he got Peter back on track with this. So now Peter is actually doing this properly and he's, he's still doing a bit of trading, but what he's done is managed to separate the two. So he's managed to now get his observation time uh, at one time and, and he's doing that and he's, and he's really happy with that and he's fine with that. And then he's got his, his trade time that he's doing uh, another time in the day and he's keeping the two things completely separate, right? And, and so he's kind of found, or he's, he's found a way uh, for him. But the bottom line is there's no point trading any setup, pattern or behavior unless you know it works, right? I mean, you know, it's common sense. It's like playing, it's like playing blackjack. You know, you, you know that you know the rules of blackjack. You know roughly how to play the game. You know you're going to lose, but you know you could probably sit at the table for a while if you play a certain way, All right? And there is a process to getting to know if it works. Um, for retail traders, it's not by clicking buy and sell. For a lot of retail traders, because they've gone through a lot of different things. You know, they've gone through people lying to them about what the market is, people selling them dodgy systems, blowing up accounts, um, lots and lots of things where, you know, a, a prop trader, yeah, they'll get a prop trader to, right, this particular setup, you're gonna drill it for hours and hours and hours and hours. But I think for, for many reasons with the retail tra traders, um, like Cameron we saw earlier on and Peter since he spoke to Rich Friesen, the moment they start to do this observation, they re really accelerates their uh, really accelerates the, the rate at which they they um, get on. So that the results from Cameron is purely what he'd um, since his last time. And his his comment to me, Cameron's comment to me, was basically, I can't believe this is real. So he can't believe that after such a short period, he actually knows something about the market. Something he actually feels very close to the market and actually feels that he really understands something about the market and it's just, just a big surprise for him that he found it in such a short amount of time. Um, you're not gonna see these things if you're emotionally invested in the outcome. So if you're excited about the winners and sad about the losers, you will never see the fact that the losers are what makes you money, right? Um, if you carry on doing what you did before, you are very likely to do what, to get what you got, got before. And, um, and you can't change as you go along, right? So as you saw from Peter when he was trying to trade it and follow it he was changing and changing and changing and the moment he changed something just that you know even just a fairly small thing the moment you change something in what you're observing you, you're basically doing a reset right you start you're starting again your observations before that change are, are generally going to be pointless right and, and of course every hard and fast rule has got an exception right so you know you, you know the, 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 you know there's a little bit of wiggle in these things but basically if you keep changing what you're what you're looking for um, every time you change, then it's a reset. Now, obviously, if you watch something for five days and it never happens, then you know, there's no point doing another five days, right? So, so there, is, there is obviously a time to change something, but if you keep changing it as you go along, it's um, obviously not going to work. And, um, you know, generally speaking, it's going to take a few weeks from the moment you decide to stop making changes. Now, that does depend on a couple of things, right? It does depend on being a market that you can actually watch. It does depend on you watching it at a time where that thing occurs. It does depend on you looking for something that has a decent frequency rate, right? Now, will the thing you end up finding, uh, or, or, well, first of all, will this two-week process always find you a profitable setup? The answer is no. Um, will you move forward though? Absolutely yes, right? You might find something that you thought would be profitable and you realize it's not, it's not gonna work out. There's no real way to make money. Um, one of the things Peter told me about one of the, his first setup, he said that he could have up to 12 losers in a row. Uh, but the you know, and I said, well, yeah, you know, he said I'd lose all the money if I did that. And he said, well, well, one answer is that if you do have long runs of losers, but it's a winner overall, is scale into the winners, right? Because, so you're not going in full size, so you can then tolerate that run of losers. So, you know, a lot of it isn't just about seeing an all in all out strategy, it's about building the stats and saying, well, how would I approach this? You know, maybe I need to scale out. Maybe I need to scale in. Maybe it's all in, all out, all in. Okay. And the other thing about this process, you know, there are some setups that occur in the market and some behaviours that come and go. 
So, so sometimes you'll find a behavior that's like good for three or four months and then it just fades away. But the fact that you've been through this process means you're now tuned in, you now know how to find a setup, you now know how to, um, you know, to adjust, uh, you now know how to understand if it's you or the market um, and to move, move forward from there. And, um, and that's it. So I just wanted to update you on Cameron. So we've got two traders now that we're looking at. They're both uh, different backgrounds. So Cameron's, uh, Cameron is a businessman and um, he's also a musician. Um, Peter's a, a senior manager, a, a senior manager in a company, um, or he was a senior manager in a company. He's, um, for various reasons, he's now, he's now not doing that. Um, somebody's had a very, very successful career. And uh, so what we'll do is over, obviously with their blessing, I don't want to put pressure on them, right? So, you know, we can at any, you know, what we don't want is to have two people who are working uh, with an eye on all of us for the next webinar, right? Because we know that's going to throw them. But, you know, with their blessing, um, we, will, we will hopefully come back to them. But we'll also look at other people who are quite happy um, to go through this process. So at that point, do we have any questions? give that a second no questions yet can any of you relate to what these guys are doing and and, and maybe that this is that this is a, a very much a man thing this kind of um, you know swinging from the hip kind of thing do you, you actually relate and, and kind of see yourself because I can I can absolutely I'm the guy who, I'm the guy who's gonna get bitten on I in fact read me reading that most snake bites are men getting bitten on the face or neck has probably saved my life at some point in the future. But it's just like, it's just it's just very common, right? We all wanna kind of, we all wanna hit it. So what we've got, we've got a lot of people um, saying um, absolutely can relate to it. So, you know, the reason we bring this, it's just, it's not for us to tell you what to do, right? You're big boys and girls. Um, it's, it's, it's up to you to kind of, um, you know, get yourself where, but just to give you some experience from other people, um, tell you what other people have, uh, work with Peter's here. Thank you, Peter, for letting us uh, use your example. And um, you know, uh, Drew's also saying, you know, he gets on the leaderboard, ends up trading way more size than they should go off plan. Um, yeah, absolutely, all those things. So, what I'd like to do, as we've got no questions, but a lot of people nodding their heads, I would like to say thank you. And we'll do this again in about a month. And I will promise I will sort out the time zones. In fact, I am actually going to get my wife to check. That I've booked the meeting properly next time. So I'd like to say thank you. Um, guys, I really appreciate you turning up. And um, I will see you sometime in May, towards the end of May. Thanks, guys.